episode of the uh, try to understand the different implications of Web3, Metaverse, uh, generative AI in the hospitality and the travel space. This is a very special episode because, as you can see, we are not in the usual fully views room, but we are in a very different location. And to introduce the location, I'm going to uh, go to my first guest of the day, and that is Paul. Paul, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, can you tell us a little more about yourself, what you do, your company, and uh, the location we are filming from? Oh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Paul Burrows. I am the principal software solutions manager for what we call Reality Capture at Leica Geosystems, uh, we, which is part of the Hexagon Group. So I work specifically with um, anything to do with reality capture in our software. So 3D laser scanning, mobile mapping, where we create representations of 3D space and then you know, uh, create these amazing platforms to share the data. So today uh, we're sitting in uh, an asset that we scanned with one of our scanners, the RTC360. Uh, we process that data in a cloud platform that we have called Reality Cloud Studio. And we've got this wonderful mesh, which we then used to uh, a, a, a super lightweight mesh, I should say. So a sub 100 megabyte mesh that we then have dropped into spatial. And that's where we're having the meeting today. And you can see we're going to we'll maybe get the chance to talk about um, you know, Reality Cloud Studio later. That's what's playing on the screen now. And so this is a great way to not only create content that you can share in metaverse spaces, but also a great way to kind of collaborate and meet in spaces which are otherwise inaccessible. So, you know, this, this location is in the UK. You guys are from all over. And here we are today sitting in this virtual space. So, yeah, that's uh, me. And that's a bit of an intro to the data and where we are. Well, that's pretty cool. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to introduce Luca. And maybe before we even start, uh, can walk us around for a couple of minutes so we can take a look at the space and uh, for people uh, looking at this in, in 2D. So, uh, Luca, first of all, thank you for uh, arranging this. Uh, you were the point of contact with Paul, so uh, it's very, very appreciated. Um, you've been here before a few times, but uh, for people that uh, uh, don't know what you do, could you introduce yourself in a few words? Yeah, sure. Thank you again, Simone, for, for having me here again and uh, for, for having me in the Polybius community, actually. Yeah, I'm Luca Lupatelli. I'm a digital project manager at Exagon Geosystem. Um, and uh, aside of that, I'm very passionate about all the metaverse topic and uh, I'm just more curious. I define myself like an explorer because I really see what I'm doing, trying to explore, um, you know, words, creations, and uh, this is more passion. But yeah, that's pretty much me, and uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to take more time on that. So thanks, thanks Simone, again. Well, thank you. And then we got uh, we got Ricardo. We got a, a few issues in getting uh, Ricardo on the on the meeting, so we're going to test again. Um, in the meantime, Paul, let's go for a little walk and maybe, maybe you can follow us with the camera, but I would love to take a look around. So maybe you can tell me more about the location because it, that's pretty cool. I didn't have much time to go around, so maybe you can uh, you can tell me more about this space, okay? Yeah, so we're yeah, following no, you. yeah, no worries. So I live in the West Midlands in the UK and we have a very, very extensive um, canal network, in fact, I live very near near to Birmingham, which has more canals than Venice. Would you believe? So, um, which is, yeah, which is a which is a very impressive fact that we tell everyone. <laughs> because <laughs> it's maybe the maybe the most uh, interesting fact. But yeah, the building that we're looking at here is, and um, well, what we haven't got in the distance is this is right next to a canal and the canal network, and effectively, um, this this warehouse, bonded warehouse is where goods would be stored until they were kind of cleared, uh, various taxes were paid and stuff like that. So it's a very historical sort of site of significance. And then you've obviously got all the offices that are associated uh, with the building as well. Um, but yeah, there's been a lot of regeneration in the past few years. So these buildings are now very, very looked after. So this is now no longer a warehouse. It's uh, you know, function rooms um, down here. 
into the distance which you can't see where we kind of how the hills in the background is is you drive down there or walk down there towards the actual canal which then joins all the way through to uh to birmingham and beyond uh but yeah this is the space so you can see the old cobbled streets um there's uh, a pub which is very nice called the old wharf inn which is just over the over the way there by over the fences in the distance that's uh, you can see the tents that's the but, one on the um, left right that's uh that's yeah the one over there the yeah tent, and okay and so, so effectively, what we're looking at here is just, you know, we've scanned this with the RTC 360, and then we've processed this into a really, really uh, low polygon, lightweight mesh that we can use in spatial. So I think in total, Luca, this was maybe 58 megabytes or something like that? Yeah, it was very small, actually. It was like maybe 70, 70 megabytes, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was, it was very small. And, and obviously, you know, like the video that's playing on the background is, is, is a much higher quality um, data set with a higher, you know, higher point count. But Spatial has some limitations around the mesh size that you need to use. You can see on the, <laughs> I've just spotted actually, Simone, if you turn around, you can see an Easter egg of my face plastered on the wall of <laughs> this building yeah. where I got yeah. captured while I was sitting. <laughs> So yeah, I didn't I didn't manage to escape from uh, the, the the capture, unfortunately. Okay. So, yeah, this is, but this is yeah you know, the what process. Is, is like, this is like an Easter so, yeah. egg. It's something that you, you yeah. wanted to do, or just <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It's completely <laughs> unintentional. But uh, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Let's call it an Easter egg. Okay. No, because this is, I think this is pretty interesting for destinations because a lot of like I I get this question pretty often, right? And uh, for Hotels, maybe this is perceived as easier, um, but for destinations, uh, this is usually something that is perceived as pretty complicated. But I look at the file. Actually, Luca sent me the file a couple of days ago to upload it. And uh, yeah, it was like a, probably 60 megabytes, something like that. So uh, what is in terms of timing? So let's say we got a, we, we got a destination that wants to uh, start creating a digital twin in in the metaverse so let's say in the spatial what is the what is the process well i mean the first thing is um you actually need to capture the space and the best way to do that the most accurate way to do that is by um is by laser scanning 3d laser scanning so we can either use a handheld laser scanner like a blk to go or we can use um, what we call an rtc 360 or a blk 360 we basically just move around the uh, the space and we capture lots of positions and then we turn this into one cohesive project and one cohesive data set. So, for example, the video that you can see playing behind you, Simone, this is a data set uh, from a World War One memorial in the US. That was probably, oh. I don't know, 20 setups of worth of data. Um, and then obviously you've got the full geometry, you've got the color, you've got the photography, you've got the panoramic images. Um, so it just becomes a, you know, a really nice space to walk through virtually. And, you know, obviously I can't get on a plane tomorrow and jump across to Detroit or wherever this was and see it, or I could, but it would cost me a lot of money. Um, so the fact that people can access this and see this in, you know, incredible high fidelity is very valuable. But yeah, ultimately, it's a simple process now because what we do is we upload the scan data to uh, a cloud platform, which we call Reality Cloud Studio, and it automatically creates these assets for us. So these these meshed assets. So it's a completely hands off approach. You just you know click click on it and say generate a mesh, and it goes off. And then what you can see in the background, this tour that I've created, that was created with a couple of clicks. And then you can share that tour directly, or you can share a link to the asset directly so that anyone can jump in and see that through an iPad or an iPhone or a browser. So it's super accessible as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the basis of how we get from a scan through to delivering you know, these meshed assets, which we can explore. So let's say, so who is the, because like uh, right now, if, 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 uh, if a destination need uh, i don't know a new photo shooting for example you know you 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 call a photographer now who is the right person to call to do the laser scanning is, is this feel like a, a video maker a photographer it, it should be a, a dev what is the profession we're dealing with when we start working on a project like that 
No, I mean, that's a really interesting question, Simone, because um, over the last few years, we've seen def a definite shift in our customer base. And I think any manufacturer has seen a shift in the customer base to uh, a lot more people accessing this technology. And I don't mean just the end result, but actually the data collection. So we've gone from products. When I first started doing laser scanning in 2003-ish, something like that, um, these products cost about £150,000 or you know, whatever that is in euros, €160,000. And you can now pick up a, a laser scanner for you know anywhere between kind of 15 and 20,000 euros essentially. So the price of access to deliver this data has got really, 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 uh, you know, there's a much lower barrier to entry. Um, but what we're seeing is, you know, yes, surveyors use the kit, but there are also, as you just said, you know, there's photographers, there's, um, you know, there's, there's, let's call them digital surveyors who may not be, you know, uh, official surveyors who are, you know, putting everything on GPS control, you know, uh, like, sorry, GPS as in putting it in the real world coordinate systems. There's people who are previously or previously had thought this was not a, they were not able to do it, but now the price, the price point allows us to do it. There you go. <laughs> There's a picture of a scanner. Whoever's just shared that, uh, that image into the scene. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's the um, one, right? Because again, what I'm trying to do with you guys today, today it's a more, it's more like a technical episode, right? So we're not talking about like, possible applications or the philosophy of the metaverse i just i just really want to understand how you guys do it and so this is a laser scanner right yeah yeah so this is a laser scanner so if you're looking at that picture um effectively in the middle you've got a laser a, a laser and you've got various cameras so the laser captures the 3d data and the cameras obviously capture the color um, you do a setup which typically takes let's say two minutes to capture the scan data and the color and then you move to another position. Now, one of the great things about this device, um, in particular, the, the RTC360, is it's got a system that actually tracks your position through the 3D space. So it's actually creating the model as you're moving along, effectively. So it's creating this registered data set as you're moving through the project, which means it's not as complicated as it used to be, which means more people can use it, which means more people can create these tours and these experiences. Um, so, you know, that the, the, pro the, the product that you're looking at there is about, I don't know, say 42, 45,000 euros, something that kind of price. Um, but yeah, the, the BLK 360 and the BLK, the second generation of the BLK 360 are, like I said, between like 15 and 20,000 euros. So um, there's lots of different products. They all deliver roughly the same thing. You know, this 3D point cloud, there's obviously differences in the, the collection speed, the, the accuracy, also the quality of the color and the panoramic imagery. But yeah, that's, that's in essence what we do. We also have some handheld devices as well. There's a device called the BLK to go. Uh, we also have a flying laser scanner called the BLK to fly. Uh, we have one which attached to robots, which is called the BLK Arc, which stands. So is it? Uh, um, and, I, and I don't know if, if this is just a blasphemy, but it's like a, a laser drone. Yeah, exactly that. So if anyone has ever watched any kind of crazy movies where they've seen something flying around, scanning something in 3D, that is now a reality. Uh, um, you know, you can send the BLK to fly up. And you can scan, you know, maybe you scan the inside with a BLK 360 and you scan the top of the building with a BLK to fly and you bring that all together to create one big data set. But, yeah, we've got lots of different technology for delivering, you know, a very accurate representation of, you know, a, a 3D space. So that's the that's the 360, right? The, the black. That's the 360. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that came out last summer and that also also has this viz technology that allows you to track between positions so it knows where it is relative to the last position so you scan you pick up your tripod and walk to the next location you scan and it and it stitches it all together for you automatically so if i if i understand correctly over the last 15 years or so the price of doing something like that just to to scan the environment went down by uh, 10 times something like that yeah yeah roughly yeah something along those lines and um and also the speed at which the data is processed has improved 
and now we have solutions you know like reality cloud studio that's playing on the screen where you know you drag and drop this data into the browser you put it in the cloud and it and it can do registration it can do meshing it can create these videos all within a cloud platform so it, it creates a really nice ecosystem uh, that's super easy to use and also you know reality cloud studio starts at about 19 euros a month or 20 euros a month for a subscription for the lowest tier so someone can start get started very very easily by sharing this data for you know, a nice low price as well oh well, that's fascinating luca let me ask you something um and you know the the italian the italian industry it's uh, as as many other European destinations, um, they are not, uh, I don't want to be, I want to, I'm trying to be as much politically correct as I can, but let's say they're not like always super tech savvy. Let's put it like that, right? And um, so let's say that tomorrow we got a, we got a destination like, uh, you know, Rome, okay? I live in Rome, so that, that makes sense. That uh, wants to do something similar for, for uh, I don't know, the Roman Forge, for example, right? So step one is we call you guys, you come with the laser scan uh, or the laser uh, scan drones, whatever. And then step two is creating the space. Now, in terms of understanding what you guys do, because I think this is another problem. I think that for a lot of people, this is just a, just a, a, a simple virtual tour. Do you think that we will need to re-educate destinations to make sure they understand that not only this is feasible now, but it's 10 times less expensive than it was 10 years ago? Well, I think, uh, I think that's, that's a very valid point. We have to think about that, what Paul just said. We are kind of, kind of moving versus a kind of democratization of 3D asset creation, right? So... Um, I think it's it's very, very it's going to be very important for people to understand that you know now you can easily build up something uh, a twin of like an historical place or an area and I mean it's kind of easy you you, you get a scanner and you need to know how to use the scanner and then may, maybe Paul you can add more here because you know how much is easy to to play with the scanner that's another point right um but now you can you can have it you can have a twin of, of the colosseum for instance you know for people that don't know the colosseum at all you know people can have the chance to enter the colosseum virtually that is an accurate twin of uh of the real one so, so that's I think it's very it's very important for people to understand that for for entrepreneurs for even for the for the municipality of Rome you know to understand that there is something that that is happening that can support a city like like Rome to attract tourism. So it's just I, I, it's yeah I, I agree I agree Luca and I think that what's really exciting is. You know, we talk about we talk about digital twins and we talk about this representation but it's it's a way to also protect that tourism as well because you know if you've got millions of people trampling through these places every single year there's possibly going to be damage so you want to make sure you've got an as-built record of the site so not only can you share it and you can allow people virtual access but if, for example, you have to close it for a season because there's some work that needs to be done, or maybe there's a part of it that is inaccessible, why should that mean that someone doesn't get to see it just because it's inaccessible? Use the scan. You know, give them, you know, give them an example, you know, give them the ability to view it on their phone or their iPad so they, you know, that they don't feel like they've missed out. Um, and also, you know, I, I, you let me give you like, a, sorry if I interrupt, but I have a perfect no, example fine. for you. Okay? So uh, I was on a plane today. Uh, and I was coming back home, and, um, and and I had this wonderful lady, probably late uh, 60s, something like that, from uh, Florida. And uh, uh, she was uh, coming from Paris. She was uh, going to Rome. And we started talking. And uh, she said, look, I want to see this and that, blah, blah, yeah, whatever, the Colosseum. And I said, you know, I really would like to to see the catacombs, you know, that I don't know for, for whatever reason they're something people want to see but what she said to me so look 
is it very hard to get in? Like, uh, because I don't know if you've ever been there, but there are a lot of steps going down and it's, you, you need to walk a lot. Now you need to be a little physically fit to get there. And I thought, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend it to you. It's a great experience, but, you know, you, you can be a little more claustrophobic and it takes, uh, you know, you need to be, probably I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest it to, to somebody in her late 60s. So, and I think that the metaverse in this sense, or VR or extended reality, spatial computing, call it as you like, could to a certain extent democratize the industry of, of travel that uh, historically has always been very snobby. And another thing, and I'm going to stop because Michael always say that I'm the, I'm the king of long questions. But uh, uh, my wife lived in Egypt for a little while, right? And uh, she told me that now they are closing down uh, uh, many, uh, many, many tombs just because tourists are damaging them. And my fear is that I will never be able to see it because maybe in 20 years, uh, this will be closed forever and this will all will be the only way to discover that location so do you agree with me that in a in a certain sense this can democratize the travel industry oh absolutely i mean the the, the thing is you know at the minute for example the data we're seeing on the screen yes you can visit it physically there's no limitations because it's not being damaged but i actually my background simone i didn't know when you knew this but now you know my background is in archaeology so that's how that's how I got into 3D laser scanning in the first place was not only scanning oh. to preserve stuff, but was actually scanning to share and disseminate stuff that people couldn't see. So, um, you know, for example, one I remember one of my early scans I did was of this uh, castle and it was a ruined castle, but there's no public access to the castle. So this it was a project to share the data with the local community because it was unsafe. So the children couldn't play on it anymore. People couldn't walk around it anymore because bricks were falling off and stones were falling off. So we scanned this castle and created this beautiful 3D model and, and, a, and a representation of what it looked like in the 14th or 15th century. But without laser scanning, we wouldn't have had that very accurate basis to do that. And we wouldn't have also had an as-built record. So, yeah, for, for me, from a personal standpoint, it's very, very important to start with a very accurate baseline of data, which we can then use for multiple different things. And, um, you know, people are, you know, not everyone has limitless money. Not everyone can travel the world and see all these places. So to have virtual representations of them is, you know, there's already tons of Google Maps tours that you can do. And there's already multiple startups that allow you to visit sites, you know, virtually. But the thought, you know, I, I, I'm, I think I'm from an, uh, a 3D first mentality. And there's a generation of people behind me and younger kids who expect a 3D experience, not a 2D panoramic experience. They want to immerse themselves in the, in the data sets. So, you know, I think about my kids using Fortnite. They expect 3D. So this has to be part of any plan in hospitality moving forward. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And on top of that, I think that for some tourists, that is, uh, that is the only way to go. Again, uh, I always think about people with limited, limited mobility, for example, or, uh, you know, elder tourists. So it, it totally makes sense. But sorry, Luca, I just want to ask another one to Paul, yeah. because if your, if your background is from archaeology, I was, I was thinking this could also create like an additional level of tourism. So let's think about... Uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Pompeii, for example, in Italy, right? I have. Uh, I have, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, you will never be able to see, to see it as it used to be. So do you think in that case, the, 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 the scanning could also help to have a glimpse of, of what destination, uh, destinations looked like in, in the past? Do you think this could be a, a viable like a business solution, like a an extra revenue stream for destinations. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's up to the person who's collecting the data as to how they want to monetize this, right? Or, you know, if, 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 if a surveying company is collecting this on behalf of, let's say, Pompeii or City of Rome or whatever, it's down to the person who's paying for the survey to understand how they want to use that. But what's to say you don't create a full digital twin of Pompeii? And by the way, there's been a lot of scanning done at Pompeii already 
Um, but yeah, who's to say you don't you don't scan the whole thing and provide someone with like a pass to access that 3D data, and they have you know a month or a year access or unlimited access or whatever, so they can go in and see that data. Or maybe in the future you want to download that 3D environment and you want to access it through your VR headset. I bet Luca would be interested to to do that because he's always in the VR. <laughs> So, um, you know, or even, you know, even in your phone or whatever, but I, I definitely think that there is an untapped, you know, um, revenue stream for sure. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just how people want to, you know, what people want to do it. I mean, I think that oftentimes it's best to give it free of charge and that creates the hook and the demand. And then people say, okay, well, I've seen it in 3d and I love it. I've seen it on my screen but I actually want to go and visit this place. And then you can even have like oh. links to holiday companies. You can link out to websites where you can book the tours. You can almost use the 3D space as like a hub for, you know, this is just my idea that you use it as a hub for then other people. So people pay for a virtual advertising billboard space within the virtual space, maybe. Um, you know, you don't, you don't want it to be, you don't want Pompeii to become like Las Vegas, but I hope you, you, you can probably understand what, what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but, but to a certain extent, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's a destination that can be managed in that way. And anyway, this is something that is happening anyway in a 2D environment. Like if you go on Booking.com, you will have advertisers. If you go to Expedia, you will have advertisers. So it's not like, it's not really a blasphemy here. The only thing we're, we're talking about is making sure that when you are into this 3D experience, you are not redirected to a 2D experience that will break the magic. And, uh, you know, so uh, in metaverse or in game or in VR advertisement, uh, uh, immersive commerce, that's a big topic in, in, in the industry because right now that's the problem with uh, pre-visualization, both in hotels and in destinations. You can get into a, into a destination, you can get into a hotel room, but if you want to book it, or if you want to book a package or a tour, whatever, you still need to go back to a 2D environment. So yeah, that's uh, that's a great way of, of putting it. Um, so and so, some, it. so uh, yeah, that's really exciting actually, Simone, because uh, there, there's a number of companies that have approached us in the last sort of few months since we announced Reality Cloud Studio, and they kind of provide this layer across the top. And we were like, okay, well, you know, if we have an API, and there is an API, but you know, a more formal API that allows these companies to kind of build this experience but in a real 3d sense so like you said i love that phrase that you just used we say when we don't want to break the magic so you keep people in the space whilst they're doing this stuff and it's a, it's a little bit to me like the vision for the apple vision pro where you, you've got all these screens but they're all in 3d and and it's still a it's still a common experience but it's just done in a slightly different way does that make sense Oh, but I think I, I, I don't know. If, if I can add something, Simone, sure. uh, sure. just to follow what uh, what what Paul was just mentioning, because now, now I always, when we talk about 3D, I always think about you know the new generation, right? Because Paul said, ah, the, the new generation expect th things in 3D, and uh, and that's true. I mean, if you think about that, Gen Z, for instance, is the only generation that that is born with internet, right? Maybe gen generation alpha is going to be the generation that that will grow up with 3D, and they expect to see only things in 3D. We are happy with the 2D, but what about the, the expectation of the new generation? And um, and, and even we, we, even if we think flat today, because we are happy with flat, right? Tomorrow the new generation maybe is not going to be happy with flat. They they before to go and visit, for instance, Egypt. They want to visit it in 3D with their avatar, maybe with their friend, have a multiplayer experience in, in, in Egypt first. Maybe, maybe experience some virtual services, because this could happen probably. And then they could book directly, as Paul mentioned, you know, that there are some, uh, there is some movement around the, the commerce in 3D environment. And that will book directly while they are experiencing a 3D experience. Looks like weird, say it like that, but you know, I think I think that is going to be crucial. Understand the new generation. So, just, totally, just Luca. To and on top of sorry, like, sorry uh, for interrupting. No, 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 it's great. But uh, you, you, I think you're a little younger than me. Uh, 
Uh, but <laughs> look, uh, let me tell you something. Because we lived, we lived something similar 20 years ago. And Paul, you will remember that, okay? So at some point, we had websites for hotels and destinations. And, but the only thing you could do on these websites was pre-visualization. You could not book. So if you wanted to book, you had to write an email or send the fax or, 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 or give the hotel a call. So it's, it was the same thing, you know, and then we moved to an e-commerce experience. And now it's like you don't go to Amazon and then uh, you got your stuff in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the cart. And at some point you say, okay, now I need to call Bezos and, uh, and, and, put, and get the order, right? So you don't, want it, you don't want that because you're so used to the e-commerce being uh, an integral part of, of the web. That is exactly the same thing that is happening with uh, with metaverses. Like uh, uh, I understand, Paul, you got a you got a kid, right? So and I don't know if he or she plays in Roblox, for example. But of course, if they want to buy an, a, 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 um, a skin in, in Roblox, they don't want to they don't want to do it on a two D environment. They don't want to send a fax. That is exactly what is happening. It's Darwinian to me. It's not even innovation anymore. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with that. I think you're showing your age talking about faxes, Snowy. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, I did. I have, I have used a fax machine, so I, I think that ages me slightly. But uh, yeah, it's um, no, I agree. And 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 my kids do all play Fortnite. Um, at least two of them play Roblox. Um, you know, they they play multiple, you know, Rec Room and all these other all these other different um, applications. But yeah, they all expect things to be done in a certain way. Um, and also, you know, it, it sounds crazy, but there's also an expectation from all of them that everything will be in the cloud. So you know, if you I talked to my son the other day and I said, oh, you download the application. He went, why do I want to download it? Why can't I just use it on Google? <laughs> I was just like, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, there's there's other there's other things you have to consider when sharing these experiences. But I think we also have to understand, like Luca said, it's just the expectation. You know, you know it, it's how do we, how do we preempt where we're going to be? But I, I genuinely feel that 3D has to be the way forward. But it has to be 3D done well, and it has to feel real. Whoa. That's the, that's the point. Even though you're thousands of miles away, you have to feel like you're present for that, that small amount of time. Yeah, totally. And again, yeah, I think it's, it's, really, it's really just a question of, of normal evolution. It's not, we're not talking about it. I don't think we're talking about an innovation anymore. Like maybe the only innovation here is, you know, the quality of, of, the, of the camera or, or, or the scans. But in terms of, like uh, the the technology adoption, this is just the normal evolution of, of things. And I think, and this is where, uh, especially Luca, and, and you know this very well, especially in the hospitality space, we got a problem because everything that is a little more like new uh, can be perceived as uh, almost blasphemy, right? But it's not like we go from the fax machine again to a Neuralink implant in the brain. You know, technology doesn't work like that. You know, it takes time. Uh, but in our lifespan, think about how the, uh, the the interaction we do have with technology changed over time, you know? And I always look at my father, for example, in the 80s, he was super anti-computers and now he spent like eight hours a day on freaking Facebook. That's the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know so oh I, I, I hate and I hate talking about generations and I understand it's a, I think it's a little it's a, it's it's like oversimplifying it but there's no there's no other way to go and and again my kids it's it like I was reading this this article from uh, from the guy from uh, humane probably you heard of the company and uh, and he said uh, something in the lines of for my kids an iPhone will be obsolete and for us, it looks like, wow, this is just freaking impossible. But this is exactly what is happening. And I think like Apple Vision Pro is, uh, is, is, is making this all, uh, all quicker. But uh, yeah, it's interesting times ahead. But look, take a look uh, on, your, on, your, um, on your back, um, uh, Paul. Do you see this is, uh, this is what I was telling you about, you know, the, the, the Pyramid of Giza 
is going to be closed for a few years for restoration that is uh, longly due. And um, in this case, that could be like great, um, a great alternative. Okay, so you you cannot really visit it, but you can have this uh, uh, very immersive experience. And maybe it, it can be like gamified to a certain extent. This is something we didn't really talk about, uh, but maybe we can have a little more fun with the experience. So, um, well, let me go to Lucas. So otherwise, you will not you never talk. Sorry, uh, Lucas. Uh -huh, don't worry, don't worry. I think. Uh... I think that is important because here the the real expert uh, is Paul, the reality capture guru. So, so I think it was a good question for him. That okay. So I will ask the question, and whoever wants to answer, answer. But uh, um, what do you think about the implementation of gamification in this kind of experience? Um, I mean, I mean, the first thing I would say is. There's platforms like Spatial, which already exist, which are highly gamified, right? So, you know, that you can layer stuff in here, you can build experiences in here. So, anywhere we can pull the data that has got, you know, that gamification aspect, then I think that's a good thing. Um, one one trend that we've seen recently is obviously people bringing these types of assets into the Unreal Fortnite editor or, or Unreal Engine Fortnite editor. I can't remember the exact term where, yeah, you know, it's a very powerful game engine and we're not limited by, uh, we're not limited by the polygons and, and the resolution and everything because they can handle, you know, very, very large files. Spatial is not, you know, by, by its nature is not designed to handle these incredibly large meshes. But even so, even, even the mesh again on the screen that you're seeing is probably only a couple of hundred megabytes. Um, well, let's say 300 megabytes per se, and 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 that becomes a very nice experience. But again, it all down, it all comes down to the the expectation. But certainly, you know, we're working towards having open standards, which means that if someone has created a data set with our scanners, they can export the data in a format that can be read by multiple different engines, whether that's you know gaming engines or metaverse engines or you know even 3D modeling uh, packages. It, 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 you know, for example, what we're seeing on the screen, again, it could be exported as an OBJ. Well, that's like one of the most common standard formats um, used across the world for 3D visualization. That means that that will go into a huge majority of software solutions. Um, and who's to say that you, know, you don't have an Easter egg hunt within this space, or you have to go and find all the clues to get to the, you know, the top of the tower or, or something. But this, that's down to the creatives to build that, you know, and tell that story. And I think, for me, that's also where I see, I, I feel like there's a lot of excitement in the fact that we can tell a story in a space that mm -hmm. only lends itself to being in that full 3D space. And whether, and and the other thing as well, you know, Luca will tell you this is, yes, you can access it through a gamepad. Yes, you can access it through an iPad. But you can also access it through VR, which has this whole other level of immersive, immersive nature to what you're looking at. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't think there's much more to add on that. But yeah, I, I love, I love the notion of gamifying this stuff. It's great. And we did, uh, we did, uh, Luca. You remember that we did an episode, a full episode on the problem of interoperability and the need for standards. So uh, we're not going to talk too much about that. But you can go. Probably was the, the second or the third episode of polybius you can you can watch it today it was a, a pretty interesting one but uh, okay I, I Luca, think, let's, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry sorry simone just to finish that off then we, we did just actually um we announced at hexagon live last month that there was going to be uh our, well, we've kind of formalized our partnership with nvidia around uh, getting data into their omniverse platform and part of that is using what we call the usd format which is a universal scene descriptor or usdx i think it's maybe now called and um, that's part of the plan for a lot of people is to get into this USD format so it can be used in multiple places. So that's really where the interoperability will come from. If you create an asset for um, spatial, you should be able to use that in Unreal. You should be able to use that in, in Unity or Omniverse. You know, that, that, that's really the point of the interoperability, which uh, you know, we're, everyone's striving for now. Wasn't uh, isn't uh, USD the one developed developed by Pixar back in the days? Yeah, yeah, exactly that. So yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah. come out of Pixar research, and now there's a conglomerate of like 
I don't know, maybe even a hundred companies that are all kind of behind the format, effectively. Is it open source, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Good. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's genius. Okay, makes sense. Okay, great. Um, Luca, so, okay, let's go back to uh, destinations and hotels, right? So, uh, first thing first, we go with the scanning, and then we create the, uh, the, the project itself, now, uh, we need to market it in a certain way, you know, and, and Paul is, is correct when he says that, uh, you know, you can have a, a, an, an Instagram rant, for example, you know, it could be, uh, it could be something more than what you, or at least something different from what you do have in the real locations. Now, I'm thinking in the next few years, we will probably need more people to be able to do immersive marketing let's call it like that right and uh, of course we have the tech part and that's you guys uh, but then we need to have some level of creativity and uh, do you think this is going to uh, impact the way we do marketing now we do advertising now and we think there will be a disconnection between what we do now and what we will do in the next few years yeah i think probably it's going to be very much different in the future i mean and again, um, I just the, the first thing that I mind the expectation of those kids, right? Um, the all of, I mean, if you think that Roblox has 66 million users and they just go there because people are there, that this generation is there. So, in, in the and I and I kind of see, you know, what it, maybe, and this is just a maybe, you know, why the all of those big brands are opening like, uh, words into this platform like let's think about nike land let's think about like uh, uh walmart land and things that they have millions of users you know may maybe it's going to shift a bit in that way right so uh, again the audience is going to be in those immersive platform it's going to be uh, today is there you know a, a lot of gen z are are playing roblox are playing fortnite and um, it's going to be interesting to see how the behaviors of those people is going to evolve because that's you know today we probably we're going to go through a kind of phase of web 2.5 you know where we use web 2 tactics to bring users into immersive spaces right but then in the future i'm not quite sure actually how it's going to be i mean i, mean, I know that that there are actually uh, some interesting projects that they raised a lot of money to, to be built. Like I have in mind Lighthouse that is a search engine for immersive spaces, right? So may, maybe that is going to be a, a, the future of search, you know, into immersive spaces. And when everything is going to be interoperable, it will be very easier easier uh, to, to market, um, you know, um, market, you know, travel, uh, for instance, or to market destinations. Um, of course, it's all about creativity, as you just said. You know, the, crea the creativity, we will see some changes in the creativity, even probably thanks to the generative AI that will support a lot, you know, this category of, uh, of people in the marketing. You know, it, it's going to be important really to follow how this is going to evolve in the future. Uh, um, for, for I have to be very honest. I don't have a clear answer yet how we are going to market uh, destinations when Generation Z will join the workforce and will have money to spend in, in travels, into uh, hotels, into you know those those kind of experiences. I, I'm sure that 3D and the immersive experience is going to play a crucial role where where you know companies will will invest also into immersive services probably services that happen into immersive spaces but um but you know it's 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 going to be probably you know um probably uh we will see you know the, the growth of those platform like roblox uh, uh, or i don't know but we will see a transition phase uh for marketing purposes that's 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 clear to me so 
Um, yeah. Well, I think no, that, well you actually you is. actually have a, have a great point with with meta. So basically, what you're talking about is like a meta search for immersive spaces, and that could that could actually be a great idea from a travel perspective. So it's something like uh, let's say a Trivago for immersive destinations and with more yeah. interoperability that could actually be great because yeah right now the search in immersive spaces kind of sucks like uh, uh you, you can go to spatial and you can search for spaces here but uh spatial is only giving you back results from spatial and if you want to know for example where uh I don't know, uh, Gucci is, or uh, Balenciaga, or whatever, or, or Nike is, is doing stuff in immersive spaces. You need to keep up with all the different platforms. So actually, an aggregator of the immersive spaces is a freaking ooh. good idea, Luca. I'll tell you what, yeah. I'll tell you what, you've just come up with the next billion-dollar unicorn, Luca. It's a cross <laughs> metaphorical <laughs> search engine. Yeah. <laughs> But assets, and I mean that's 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 quite the uh, that's quite the impressive um, idea there. I like that. There's some good vision there. That's, yeah, it, that's what actually, I like. If about you, like, if you go to like, because you always when you talk to people, you always have these insights. You know, the, the best ideas I had uh, were during this conversation. And I think, look, you need to copyright this. You're kind of like now, <laughs> Quick. get out of this space and copyright the idea. <laughs> Let's go and start building it right now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> but you know what? Yeah, it's but you know, it's completely feasible with like a set of standards behind everything. So if you say, right, okay, you have to, um, you you have to segment your data set so that you can search for you know trees or lamp posts or st statues, monuments, and somehow that information is stored as metadata, like a like a you know like the old search engine opt. So search engine optimization kind of tags and stuff within, um, uh, you know, from Google and everything, it, it, you could absolutely push it forward. It's just whether people would want that interoperability. I mean, we as a vendor want interoperability because we want to be able to push our data to as many places as possible. But does Roblox want to play fair with spatial? Does spatial want to play fair with, uh, you know, with Roblox? You know, it's just those kind of, discussions yeah you know, we can all say we want to be open but unless the competing platforms actually make something open then it's a it's a non-starter of a conversation but paul do yeah, you yeah. think don't you think that at some point being open will be like the expectations because like i, I, think I, it, I wrote a post I, I wrote a post the other day about uh threats uh, i don't know if you read this one but uh, yeah i and, have yeah and to me and I was a little con yeah, I wasn't concerned, but it didn't make make much sense, you know. Like from from Mister Centralization himself, it's coming something that uh, you know platforms such as Minds are trying to do for a long time. But do you think that in the future, and I would love to see that, uh, the the this kind of openness and interoperability and decentralization will be the norm, just because users will expect that exactly I, I, now as like now people expect uh, kids expect immersive experiences i absolutely do and i and you know this is why there's this uh, is it the open metaverse standards forum luke i can't remember the exact uh, yeah, you know, group, but forum. We, yeah but MSF? hexagon is yeah hexagon is part of that so we signed up to the charter and um yeah we're part of that and we we absolutely agree and, and i think What's interesting is a lot of these big companies have proprietary formats and have proprietary ideas about how things should work. But ultimately, the consumer will go where they find the least friction. That's my that's my 100 percent uh, feeling. Customer will find their way to deliver an experience as cheaply, as innovatively, as easiest as possible. And if something is closed and clunky and hard and, and expensive, they will just move away and that company will lose money and that company will lose customers. So, you know, we, I can't say too much about what we're doing in the background, but definitely there is a push towards openness and, uh, and, and interoperability. And I think that's a positive move, definitely.
But again, it happened. It happened. That's another thing that happened. So to me, it's quite, and I don't understand why so many companies are so stubborn when it comes to uh, being closed. You re- remember the, the 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 war of browsers back in the late nineties, right? That was a very similar situation where you had take a, a decision as a as a dev as a designer because you knew that websites would not have worked in all different browsers and at some point the users just said no you know fuck it this is not going to happen you know we want to make sure that i can go with whatever browser and check out whatever website so i think again that this is just it's something that is coming probably from the from the the bottom up so users will expect that and because users expect that the market will have no other options than uh, than to adapt and again, yeah like i said I like Gutenberg yeah, it's, there, it's it's a great sign yeah and like, like i said you know you, as soon as you start to see a dip in your user base and you start to see people moving away because you're making things uh, hard then you're probably too late to realize and to make the change so I, you know, all of these companies, you know, Luca and I have had lots and lots of conversations about interoperability. Um, and, and at the minute, there's so many different metaverse spaces. There's so many siloed ecosystems. Uh, a lot of them are just going to disappear because people will try them once. They'll find the flaw or the reason why they don't want to use it and they'll move on to the next one. Um, yeah. And I think what's interesting is, you know, we've, we, myself and Luca have consistently come back to spatial because we find it very easy to use. It has open integrations. It integrates with various wallet systems and Ready Player Me for avatars. It's easy, you know, it's easy to access for anyone who's not already got an account. Um, and it does things that you expect, but all with as little friction as possible. So that's why we've come back to it. And, and, and if that conversation is happening a million times over, then that's when that customer is just going to grow and grow and grow. That company could it be like uh, the WordPress of the metaverse to a certain extent? The what? Sorry, the the WordPress, WordPress. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. In the same way that you know Shopify says they're the WordPress for e-commerce, then yeah, I won't mm. say that necessarily it's spatial that is that space because there's still so many different ones. And Luke and I have dealt with a lot of different <laughs> metaverse yes. engines. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think someone has the power to be the kind of dominant space but at the minute if you look at it in real terms away from like creating these experiences that we're talking about today for hospitality um you know fortnite and roblox are those dominant platforms yeah in real terms they may not they may not be talking to the right demographic yet but they will be in a few years time (laughs) but i think uh look didn't didn't roblox publish some data about uh, uh, the, the the audience being older than it used to be just a couple of years ago. Like maybe uh, in the yeah. now, something like that. I, I, mean, I can probably find it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are some interesting charts. Uh, I was like researching a bit about Roblox a couple of, I mean, uh, one, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and um, yeah, the demographics are kind of, I mean, there, if I'm not mistaken, around 30, 40% is is gen z uh and then uh, if i'm not mistaken then i need to i need to look at i think i think i can find it quickly um the numbers because i wrote down because i'm documenting this kind of stuff but it's everything is has been published on on the web uh it's 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 still it's still a lot there is still a lot of gen z and gen alpha and gen alpha this is something that i that i that i that i hundred percent sure uh, let me look. And at it's it. on Quest now as well, you know. For like a couple of days ago. this is going to be this is going to be a very interesting one because now that, yeah. that this Roblox goes on Quest, it's going to gain more audience and there and people are going to look more immersive experiences uh, in Roblox because uh, Roblox is is kind of uh, I mean they have sixty six daily act- million sixty six million daily active users so this is this is huge right and they grew. In one year, they grew 10 million daily active users. Um, and if you look back into years, it was it, it grew it grew up 20 million daily active users. And we are talking just about Roblox. 
is like growing like massive. I just got the data published, here, actually. I published something on LinkedIn today. I was, I was reading it on the plane, right? Yeah, yeah. it's 29% is Gen Z, 40, 45% Gen Alpha. So, you oh. know, 45% of the Roblox audience is between under 9 and under tw and, and 12 years old. So we are talking about, it's a good number. And 15% 15, 15 is between 13 and 16 years old. And then we have, uh, we have between, we had 24% between 17 years old and 24 years old. And then all the rest, gen, gen no, sorry, millennials, plus 25 years old. Where so is, it's still- it's, Where is this coming from, the directly, directly Roblox? It's coming from Statista. Studies. Okay, that's but usually yeah, it comes directly from Roblox. Okay, that's interesting. The, share the link again. I, I will share it at the end of the of the show. That's interesting, guys. Uh, I would love yeah. to talk to you for another hour, but we try to keep this around one hour. But I do have a final question for you, and that is something that we didn't really, really, really uh, uh, talk about, and that is the role of AI, especially into Again, interoperability because, and you know, Paul, this is something that I ask myself very often. But let's say that tomorrow we do have a standard, right? And we can move this beautiful uh, destination from spatial to Roblox, for example. The problem is that Roblox still does have a complete different look and feel. So you got some metaverse platforms that are a little more realistic, uh, some other platforms that are more like Minecrafty in a way. And, um, and I think this will be pretty complicated if you want to redesign everything from scratch. Do you think that the role of AI could be to, I think the right term is morph, uh, basically adapt these uh, spaces into the look and feel of different metaverses in the future oh, uh, or uh, if not where do yeah, you see yeah. ai I, I mean absolutely i mean you've only got to look at tools like runway which you know converts video feed into different you know, look and feel you look at um you know all the generative fill content stuff that's happening now where you can fill in the spaces outside of the original image all automatically you know, but in particular, you know, the runway example is an example. You know, you push your you push your content in, and you say, okay, this needs to be a cartoon-like environment. So apply some element of shaders or some element of you know deconstruction and simplification. Um, absolutely, I think that there's there's a space for how AI can can benefit here, and also you know make again make people's lives easier. It might even be that that is a completely hidden operation. You know, that happens in the background as you're going from one platform to the other. And it's the platform receiving the data that does whatever conversion it needs to make it, you know, viewable or usable in that, in that other system. Um, but at the end of the day, as long as we back that all up by having a very open standard like USD in the first place, then uh, I think that's, uh, that's hugely important. So hopefully those open standards will then allow people to, say, okay, I know what the data is going to look like coming in. I know what the data is going to look like once I've processed it and maybe run some AI, you know, filters or uh, algorithms on top of it. So, yeah, I, I think there's definitely potential. But at the, at the minute, I think the biggest challenge is just actually sometimes just getting this data to display in these, in, in these engines. Um, like I said, you know, there's certain limitations on spatial, for example, and I guess each platform will have their own limitations. So, there's also an element of standardization on the expectations as well, which I think will happen over time. Won't happen immediately. Uh, but mean, yeah, uh, I, I mean, uh, user user wise expect user expectations. Um, yes, I guess. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of what I mean. Is is people will anticipate certain behavior, um, and that will drive you know that will further then drive behavior. But you know, like for example, what was interesting when Luca was saying we're trying to apply like a uh, a web point two mentality to a web point a web three point zero web three um, ecosystem. 
there's still there's going to be that hybrid moment there's going and we are i think in that hybrid moment now where people are trying to work out and feel forwards and say right okay what's this going to look like what should it look like um and you know for me I don't want to force anything yet because I'm still not sure what that should look like. And, and it's not going to be me that decides that anyway, it's going to be the, the users because the users will use what they're happy with. But at the end of the day, um, yeah, we are on a stepping stone or a lily pad right now between these two, you know, web two and web three. And uh, yeah, it'd be really interesting. But yeah, I for one, you know, absolutely agree that you know reality capture has a place, to, you know, a place uh, and a part to play in you know the hospitality industry. If if not just to gain engagement, but also sh- also to share spaces with people who won't have the opportunity to to visit. Um, and I and I think it's very you know it's a hugely exciting time. Not to mention what uh, what this can be used for. Um, building hotels you know not just having a, a glimpse of what properties could look like after renovation for example and uh it, it's something that probably it's a little more mainstream now that pre-visualization in hospitality space uh but of course the application are really limitless yeah yeah i agree absolutely i mean uh, you know of course it's a slightly different experience sharing you know the the proposed design as opposed opposed to the as built you know and it's uh, you know it's it's still you know it's a probably an easier process actually because you're just taking the design model the cad model the bim model or whatever and you're presenting it in in the 3d space but it's just as valid in getting engagement so you know getting to even build a hotel or you know where should the hotel be How, you know uh, jumping into a singular room and looking out at the view maybe the maybe the surrounding area the hotel has been surveyed with a laser scanner so that you've got a very accurate representation so you jump into your view and you go okay yeah i can see this from here or i can see you know there's a there's a there's a dump over in this corner of the city that i can see from this window we need to do something about that (laughs) it's uh, yeah (laughs) yeah okay guys let me let me end this with something funny and probably you heard about this guy that um uh, that actually, uh, let me check if I can find a picture of the, the genius. But basically, uh, a tourist, I don't remember if it was from the US, that basically carved his name into the Colosseum. I don't know if you heard that. Um, oh, yeah. Just a, yeah, we did. Yeah, 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 yeah. Naughty guy. British, British guy. <laughs> British, okay. So that, and, but Simone, Simone, same thing happened yeah. with the, with this lady from Switzerland recently, right? What was that? I missed it. I don't. It I don't was. Remember. It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't, there is a lady that brought on top of the Colosseum and was kind of getting getting a very high ticket from the police just recently. Wow. Okay. So it, basically, this is becoming a thing. Okay. Yeah, but, um, like that. Um, um, unfortunately, there's always going to be idiots, Simone. I think that's that's the point of the post. But you know, it was funny to me that at the end, uh, the guy just said, "Look, I didn't know the Colosseum was ancient," and uh, so I started yeah, I thinking, think, "Oh, I, think I have another business." <laughs> Look, I do have another business for you because uh, probably we will have more of these geniuses in the future. So. Do you think that this guy, we will have to force this guy only to travel virtually? So we're sure that they're not making any damage to anything. <laughs> so think about it, guys. Yeah. It's another source yeah. of revenue. We just, do, yeah. we just do immersive spaces for uh, bad behavior tourists that could be that could be good one. i think do you know what i think that is even too generous for these idiots quite frankly simone i think if you're willing to deface a monument which you quite obviously know is thousands of years old i don't think anyone can plead ignorance um unfortunately even my kids would know that that is completely inappropriate so um yeah i'm 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 all for a complete ban i don't even want him visiting my virtual space <laughs> Yeah, but I Gosh. think you got too much faith in humanity. Let me tell you a story and I will leave you guys. Uh, but uh, when I was a general manager, I remember this guy, um, Korean guy. So he came to me and he, and he asked me, uh, look, where is the stadium? 
and I was uh, in Rome, right? And I said, okay, uh, which one? The big one? You know, we got two football stadium. And I showed a picture and I said, no, it looks more ancient. And I started thinking, hmm, I cannot really go there. And then he asked the $1 million question. I said, look, that's the stadium where the Romans used to play football. And I did understand that he was talking about the Colosseum. So I would not be very surprised that this guy didn't really know about it. <laughs> what they did they didn't they didn't play football in the Coliseum to money? That's no it's wild, bro. But, but for me now it's an inside joke. Everybody that knows me, they know that I, I call the Colosseum the, the, the ancient Roman uh, football stadium because uh you know that, that, <laughs> Not really well, you know what? We will, we will, we will never, we will never know. Maybe they did play football there, Simone. We have no real, you know. I, my inner archaeologist will tell you that there is no evidence to suggest they did or didn't. <laughs> well, but that's your job. You're an archaeologist, so you come from there. So if you find like a, a bowl made of uh, the, the skin of <laughs> of Christian or <laughs> <laughs> so next quest for you, <laughs> guys. It was great having you. <laughs> Um, I always finish like that. What is the best way to get in touch with you? Let's start with Luca. Well, you can find me on LinkedIn. So Luca Lupatelli. So, just easy one. <laughs> and Paul? Yeah, you can find me all over. I mean, if you search for Paul Burrows or Reality Capture Guy on LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, anywhere, you should find me. So that's Reality Capture Guy. Thank you so much, guys. This was uh, very interesting. I really wanted to do something a little more technical. I think we did it. It was uh, fun as well. Paul, I hope you liked it. Thanks again for this amazing location. Luca, as always, thank you for being part of, of Polybius. And, and uh, we'll meet again in around four weeks. Uh, I still don't know what we are going to talk about, but I do have a couple of ideas. And in the meantime, I'm going to steal the idea of Luca. So, Paul, I'm going to give you a call later and we can uh, talk about that. <laughs> 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 uh, Thank you dear. so much, guys. See you next time. Yeah. Ciao. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.